Hey guys, it's Vintage Vinny, and welcome to my reselling journey, where I share with you all the history of how I got into buying things and flipping them for a profit. I am a third generation picker. And to make a long story short, it started off with my grandparents. They met back in high school. They instantly connected. They were born three years apart to the day, my grandfather being born in 1935 and my grandmother being born in 1938. Both of them shared a passion for their childhood, what they remember as kids, as most people do when they get older and they start wanting to go back in time and remember the happy things that they had when they were kids. Kind of like what my generation's doing now. They wed in April of 1958, my grandmother being 19, my grandfather being 22 years old. By 1967, they had three kids. My uncle was born in 1960. Another uncle was born in 1962 and my dad being born in 1967. Being the baby of the family, my dad was dragged to all kinds of flea markets and antique shows, antique shops, auctions, you name it, and finding all kinds of really great things. My grandparents had the passion and the love for the antique items they would clean them up and resell them for profit. Granted, a lot of things that were valuable and more desirable back then are not as desirable in today's market. My grandparents did this up until he unfortunately passed away in 1984 from cancer at the age of 48. After he passed, my grandmother slowly but surely stopped going out and finding things to pick and resell just because it was something they did together and it was, you know, something they had done for a long time. At the time of his death, my the two of them had just surpassed their 26th wedding anniversary. Which I can only imagine is pretty hard. I mean, he was relatively young. He wasn't he was only 48. And over time, even by the time I came into the picture, my grandmother was selling things off to somebody who I'm, we're still not really in contact with, but we, if we saw him, it wouldn't, it'd be easy to sit and talk to him because he's been buying stuff from my grandmother and from my family for over three decades. So over time, she sold stuff to him. He resold it just, you know, the whole nine yards. So that is my small family history on how I got started. In 1995, eBay was launched as an online store where you could buy and resell items. That was also the same year that I came into the picture. I'm still having a hard time believing I'll be 25 in just a few weeks. At the time, my dad was heavily into Pez dispensers, and he also was into the gumball charms of the 60s and 70s. Those were very popular and in demand because at the time, they weren't as abundant as they are now. So the market for both has really taken a steady decline. I mean, Pez dispensers, depending on what you have, the rarity and condition, of course, are going to determine how much something is worth. So I remember growing up, my dad would, you know, be digging through boxes in my grandmother's garage, stuff that she'd had stored for years. You know, and just fishing out all the stuff that he was able to make money on, and he would just be taking pictures as I was running around our condo, or things like that. 
And even as I was a child, we would go to antique shops and, you know, look around and see what we could find. I mean, markets were different 20, 25 years ago. Not like what they are now. And like I mentioned before, you know, the gumball charms were very popular because there just weren't a lot of them around or in circulation. Whereas now, you know, with the technology and the internet and everything, a lot of that stuff has turned up. So the value for it is somewhat not as great as it used to be. But our markets are constantly changing. There are things that are worth money now that I know for maybe in 10, 15 years that are probably not going to be worth as much. But yeah, as a kid, I would always go into flea markets and antique shops and yards. Well, we didn't have a lot of yard sales in my area, not where I used to live. And yeah, I mean, even estate sales we would go to. And before we learned about getting to an estate sale early, we would always go, like, if they were advertising it, and we'd go on the last day and see what they had. Sometimes we would get really lucky and find things that people just overlooked or didn't see were really valuable, and other times we wouldn't find very much at all. Gradually, over time, we learned that it's best to go on the first day and get what we can get, because that's the best way to find good things for both yourself and for resale. So, yeah, that's basically my childhood. Now, like I mentioned before in my familial history, at least on my dad's side, my grandmother was a collector of certain things, and growing up, I remember seeing a lot of advertising, some of the dolls, which were, like, really evil-looking. And to keep a long story short here... Um, we would have, like, a little play area in our in her family room because you had, like, the main common setting area with the TV and the furniture. And then she'd have a section with, like, shelves with dolls and stuff from, like, the 70s and 80s. She had a curio cabinet with some, like, really creepy-looking stuff. She had a corner cabinet in the far left corner of the family room. On top of it, it had a, like, a moxie board, and it had the creepy guys, like, bug-eyed, looking at you kind of image on it. And some of these dolls' eyes were really creepy. And that part of the um, room was dark, especially over time when we didn't change the bulb and the fan. So it would be pretty creepy to go over there. Even if there were other people not that far away in the common sitting area. So we had toy boxes over there, because we lived with her for quite a while. And then over time, we just felt it was necessary to move back to the condo that my dad had owned for over 10 years. But yeah, all that stuff she had, and I just remember growing up around it, and yeah, that was, that's, you know, how I got into the world, and I got to see how eBay was formed. Before we continue on to my, the next part of this video, I also forgot to mention that while I was growing up in the early stages of the eBay world, I remember my dad selling things online before there were even pictures that were required in your listing. I also remember him getting money orders in the mail, like someone would send him a check and you just have to match it up to the listing that um, the person bought, and then he would send the item out after he put the check into the bank and made sure that it was good and cleared and everything. So once PayPal came into the picture, that made things so much easier. I mean, with the transition of electronic payments and, you know, you could pay your fees, you could pay for shipping, the whole nine yards all the way, all at once, like you can do now. So much easier to be doing the reselling in today's world than it was when my dad started. As a kid, I would get $5 every week if I did the chores that were on my weekly list. So I would get $5 each week if I did what I was supposed to do. Take the garbage out, help the dishes, set the table, slash clear the table. 
wash the dishes, etc. And pretty much every weekend we would go to this one flea market and we'd go to the thrift stores in town. And, you know, at the time I wasn't looking for items to resell. I was looking for things for myself. And two of the main things that I mainly picked up were keychains. That was one of my favorite things to find when I was little. Because you could buy a ton of them for very little money. Like, you could find ones that were brand new in the package. Like, most of these I would spend no more than a dollar for. Ones that were opened, or sometimes I'd even get lucky and find ones that were brand new in the package for, like, 50 cents. And, yeah, that was, that was really fun. Another thing that I like to pick up, even still to this day, because they're somewhat collector's items now, are the Goosebump books. I will be sharing my Goosebump book collection. I, this is why I'm glad I transitioned over to my phone, because this webcam does not like to focus very well, but you get the picture. So, long story short, again, I had really uh, gotten into these books at the time, and we found a whole bunch of them in a box at this one flea market, and the books were 50 cents a piece. Very, very reasonable. And because I had been really getting into reading at that time, we bought them all, and I read each one of them. And one of the things I like about the books, rather than the TV show, at least in my opinion, is the fact that with the books, you can read it, and you can visualize it in your own way of how the story is going. Like, you can either make it way worse than what the book is um, telling you, or you could just have a general description of what was going on in the book. Now, don't get me wrong, the Goosebump book series on TV that they made in the 90s was great because it brought the stories that we read as kids to life, and it kind of gave you a bit of a broad look at what R.L. Stein's creations in his stories were telling you. But on another hand, it's great to read the books too because a lot of the things that were in the books were not shown in the TV show. So the books will give you more detail and it makes the story so much better. So I would buy VHS tapes and the keychains and some books and things like that that I liked that I, you know, used and loved and I've been a stuffaholic, junkaholic my whole life. Of course, I've gotten rid of things, and I'm not... I call myself a hoarder, but if I was a hoarder, I'd keep everything, and I don't keep every single thing. I mean, I go through my stuff periodically, and I donate things, and I resell things that I enjoyed finding at the time and wanted to keep, but then changed my mind on, and just the cycle repeats. Around 2007 or 2008, for whatever reason, I became obsessed with the vintage lunchboxes and the thermoses that went along with them. I honestly don't know where that stemmed from, but I had to have these vintage lunchboxes. And I remember we were scouring a vintage shop that was local to where we used to live in an older part of town. We found the 1963 Beverly Hillbillies lunchbox. It was $35, which at the time was a very good price, considering what they go for online. And the one that I have is in pretty good shape. At the time, it was only 43 years old. Now it is 57 years old. And... They had a Land of the Giants one, which was really cool, but they were asking well over $100 for it, which we were not willing to spend, at least because my dad was paying for it at the time. So he started me off with the vintage lunchboxes, and over time we would hit other antique shops and flea markets to see if we could find them. And I remember buying one from 1982. Um, it had Heathcliff on it, I guess the comic book character. And that just didn't sell for a whole lot, and I think I only spent like twenty something dollars on it at the time, which was about what it was worth, or not even that. And it's probably still not worth anything to this day. So that started my vintage obsession, I guess you could say.
So let's go back 10 years when I first got my own eBay account. I was buying stuff left and right, didn't care where it came from, almost, if it was something that I really liked, like anything that was Super Mario themed, I would buy it, and it, it was ridiculous. It's the same thing with the Wish app. When I got the Wish app, I was buying stuff left and right, because it was cheap, if I thought I needed it. And... I stopped. I haven't bought anything off Wish in a long, long time, and I got rid of the app. eBay was different, because you could get so many different things. You could get vintage, you could get other things on there, and other, like, necessities, and you could buy so many different things there that Wish didn't offer. So I was buying stuff left and right, and of course either draining the accounts that I had or draining the little stash of green that I had. Because at the time, because I didn't really have a lot of money and I wasn't working, whatever I bought I would just give my dad cash for because um, anything I wanted I just bought and I used his PayPal account for it and I would just pay him whatever it was that I owed so that way he would either be able to put it back or use it for whatever he needed to. Kind of backtracking a little bit, um, about a year or so, I really got into Coke serving trays, and I don't need, again, I don't know where that came from, like the lunchbox thing, and it just snowballed. The first tray I ever bought was the Menu Girl serving tray, um, I only paid like thirteen fifty for it, and then I just, I started to become more knowledgeable on these pieces. At first, it was about honoring Nana and everything that she did with vintage collecting and displaying the really cool stuff that she would find, and I wanted to carry the family homage on, and I enjoyed finding the stuff, I enjoyed the flea marketing and everything like my dad had when he was a kid, and I loved finding things that either my grandparents probably had, or things that they would remember if they were still around. Like, oh yeah, I remember seeing those blow molds at Montgomery Ward, or I remember going to, you know, Macy's and finding that years ago, or things like that. And I just, I like the vintage stuff. Like, I like things that are just not made anymore. Like, perfect example of that, vintage fans. Like, you know, a fan that cools you off. Those are great. I have one that I picked up for $2 a few years ago. I use it as ambiance. It's powerful and it's lasted years and years. If you go to Walmart or something like that and you buy a fan for like $20 and you leave it running for a long period of time, the motor will burn out. Not to suggest that you should do that with a vintage fan, but I'm sure it would hold up. So I liked to incorporate all that kind of stuff into, you know, my day-to-day -day life, kind of like how she did, and my grandfather. So, you know, once I had my own green, more than my $5 a week allowance, anytime I'd go to a thrift store, if I thought it was cool or, you know, just something that I thought was different, I'd buy it, even if it didn't have a lot of resale value. And that was, like, well before I started, like, really diving into the reselling I think that didn't start until I was about maybe 16 or 17, so maybe right at the point where I had turned 16 in 2011, like transitioning into age 17, that's when I really started to get into the whole collecting and reselling, and I made mistakes. I'm not going to lie, I, I made a lot of mistakes, like I'd buy something for a dollar and only sell it for like five or six dollars, but then again, I'm learning. I was learning at the time, and I'm still learning to this day. I don't know everything about everything. And that was really fun to, you know, just go out there and see what I could find and get it for little next to nothing. So instead of just going to the thrift stores for myself, I was looking for things that I could sell too. So that was really fun. So now I've been kicking in high gear at this point in my reselling journey for a few years now. 
And as time goes on, a lot of different things change in terms of what people are finding to resell and the different platforms that are opening. One other place that I have really been successful with in my journey is Amazon. Something I never thought in a million years I would ever get into doing. One of the many reasons why I decided to jump into it was because I felt that profit margins were higher despite the fees being higher. However, if you are cautious with what you're buying, paying attention to fees, and how much you're spending on one item, you're going to do really, really well. There are a lot of things that I used to be able to sell on Amazon, but I'm no longer allowed to because they have been restricted, which is unfortunate, but, you know, Amazon has to be really careful with what they allow and have to be careful with brands and things like that because they are so big now. And it's really funny. I remember the year before I started selling on Amazon. Again, I was watching a lot of other YouTubers pick up stuff for fulfillment. Saying, you know, I want to give this a go. And that was my New Year's resolution. And I haven't looked back since. And it was, it was really amazing to be able to go to a thrift store and have another set of eyes on a different selling platform because prior to that, I'd find a bunch of like brand new and sealed board games and, you know, just a bunch of new stuff that I would look up on eBay and it just wouldn't sell for crap. And then, you know, you scan the barcode into Amazon and you see that people are asking higher numbers for things. And that really you know, changed my reselling perspective. Because like I said before, I'd go to vendor malls where they sell new and old things. I'd find brand new and sealed things, look it up on eBay and find out, oh, it's not worth a ton of money and I wouldn't buy it with just the eBay eye. But now that I have my Amazon eye open, I'm always on the lookout for stuff like that. I think the perfect example of that is when we came up here after a Christmas season to like all the different antique shops and things like that when we were still living where I used to live. And, you know, probably one of my best sales to date would not have happened had I not had an Amazon FBA eye open. So I was looking through one of the Bender Mall booths that is in the area, and I come across a set of Bose headphones. Now, Bose is a really good brand, and I was pleasantly surprised to see what some people were asking for this item. And the only reason I picked them up was because A, the profit margin was really, really high. So that's one reason. Two was because the pro or not the profit, they were discontinued by the manufacturer. And when things are discontinued, that's usually a good sign, especially if it's a really good, high-quality item that it's worth picking up. So this mall had $29.99 on these headphones, and I believe they were um, holding like a 10% off sale, so I only spent $26. I had them in Amazon for a while. They sat, I think I had them in for like $349.99. And then sometimes what I'll do is if I have certain inventory sit, for a while in Amazon's warehouses, I'll drop the price maybe like a few dollars. And I've had really good luck with things selling when I drop the prices. And one of the things that helps a lot is doing Fulfilled by Amazon. M one of the many reasons why I do that is because I don't like to have stuff sitting in the house. When I first started selling on Amazon, I just did Merchant Fulfilled and my sales just weren't as great because stuff was piling up and it sat for a while until one day I said, I need to get this stuff out of here. That was a lot of work, but I mean, it paid off. I had a lot of sales in the beginning because when you don't have to pay for shipping on something, if you're a Prime member, people are more than willing to buy it, at least I found with the stuff that I was picking up. Anyway, back to the Bose headphones. Bought those for $26. I dropped the price to about $299.99, so essentially $300. And eventually they sold for the $300. And after fees and everything, I netted probably about $250, $260 from a $26 investment. So that was a really, really good pickup on my part. 
And I've had other great scores like that too. Like I've gone to other like indoor flea markets. I've gone to a couple of antique shops and bought some things that were a little up there in price, but knew that with what I had purchased to resell, it was going to pay the entire thing off. Perfect example of that. If you all remember in modern day, I picked up that Santa Claus Pez, the full bodied one, and I bought the uh, tin litho um, jack-o'-lantern. Uh, both cost me about 40 some dollars. 37.50 and 8 is 46.50 and with tax I can't remember it came out to like 50 something with tax. Bought those that was the most expensive thing that I had bought that day. However, at one of the other malls or like flea market places that I had visited, I found some really high-end product, like hair product, conditioner, whatever you want to call it. And I sold I can't remember how many there were. It was either two or three. I think it may have been two. And I bought them both, and I think they came to like $24 for the both of them. One sold for $89.99, and the other one, I think, sold for about $80. So, and I think I had spent probably about that, or maybe even just a little less than that at the flea market. So I, I really paid off everything that I picked up, including that really expensive uh, Pez, which I paid about thirty-seven fifty for. So that paid that off in a heartbeat, and I was really, really ecstatic because now I can enjoy that piece and not worry that I spent $30 on it because it's been paid for. So yeah, that's why I really enjoy selling on Amazon because it really opened my eyes to a lot of things that I was overlooking because... I hadn't thought about selling something there. So it is summer of 2016. I am enjoying my very first summer as a 21 year old who is now able to drink legally. I had been using Periscope quite a lot. If you don't know what that is, it was a live streaming app that was very popular for a short period of time. And then as other social media platforms took on the live action, that app slowly went down. And I'd been interacting with a lot of different people and, you know, I had decided to go ahead and join the green room and go down to Texas for one of the meetups, which was incredibly fun. I had a great time. You know, it was the first time I would have been traveling by myself by plane and going to an extremely foreign land because I had never been into the deep south before. I really enjoyed it. I Like I said, I'd never been to Austin, Texas before, so it was a really neat experience to be able to see a different part of the country. I met up with a bunch of people I'd been watching for years. It was I can't remember exactly when I started watching YouTube resellers, but it's been quite a while now. I met Thrifty Treasures, I met Bonafide, Hustler, Rake and Profit, and a bunch of other people. So that was a really fun experience for me. So I come back from that with a different perspective on what I want to do, because at the time I was going to school for criminal justice, and, you know, I enjoyed all, learning about all the cool stuff that you have to do in order to get into that field. But after seeing and talking to a bunch of other people who are like-minded, my thoughts about what I wanted to do with my life started to change. You know, a few days after I had gotten back and, you know, recovered from the really early days and the really late nights, I really started to think about, you know, a bunch of other people are able to do reselling full-time. Why can't I do it at some point? And, you know, I talked to my parents about it, and at the time, we were living in an area that was not exactly cheap to live in, so I think had I done reselling full-time there, it would have been difficult because rent and everything is just way out of proportion, at least for me, if I ever decided to move out price-wise. So where I live now is probably easier to do that. There are a lot of people who do it anyway, you know, because there are a lot of antique dealers and, you know, a lot of antique stores and vendor malls and places like that where I live now. 
places I love to go. So for the time, you know, I said, I'll finish off school and we'll, we'll go, uh, go from there. So, you know, um, summer continues. I go to the beach and come back, get ready for my next semester of school. So I get through the whole semester and then, you know, finals come up, final projects, final exams come up, and more things in life take place. My grandmother, who had been pretty sick for the last few years, her health seriously declined, and she wasn't going to get any better. So she passes a few weeks before my finals t are to take place, and, you know, we're scurrying to make sure we get up there for, you know, funeral and everything like that. Thankfully, my mom was there at when she passed because, you know, that's not exactly the easiest thing, losing a parent. And, you know, we get up there, we go to the funeral, we reunite with the family that we hadn't seen for many years. And then I make the decision to fly back early so that way I could be home for my finals and for some uh, meetups with some of my uh, classmates from one of my classes. So I'm up at the crack of dawn. My parents got stuck in Cleveland due to an ice storm, so I was able to take my dad's car to the campus that day, which was really nice. And then I had to be at work at 5 o'clock, and our meeting scheduled was for up to 4 o'clock because we had a room booked in our library. So I rush home, shower, change, and then I head to work. And, I, and at the time, because it was Christmas, or the holiday season, I had to work from, I think, 5 o'clock to about 11. Recovering that store was a nightmare. I'm glad I'm away from it. <laughs> so, yeah, it was definitely an eye-opener for me, and I didn't go to school. Like, after that one semester in 2016, that was the last time I've been at school. You know, due to everything that we had to go through financially with the hotel room and the traveling and, you know, making sure everything was said and done for laying my grandmother to rest, it was hard for us to pay for my next semester, so I said to my parents, let me go ahead and I will just work for the year and go from there. So that really was the last time I've been at school, and I've been working for, I mean, I've been working since 2014, since I was 19. But yeah, that's, that's where that whole scenario came from. And I don't think I would ever go back to school. To conclude my reselling journey, I do want to thank all of you who have supported me either from day one or as you have found me through the last seven years almost that I've been making content. It's people like you all that help motivate me to continue doing what I do. And it's really great to interact with so many different people who have like minds and who like the same things as you do, who like the same hobbies as you do. And it really helps form a different kind of friendship and way that we interact with one another. Without you all, I wouldn't still be making the videos that I do and... I wouldn't be as motivated as I am. Like, ooh, I'm excited to make a new video so I can post it so you all can tell me what you think and what you like, what you didn't like, the whole nine yards. I also enjoy just meeting up with some people. Like I mentioned before, when I went down to the green room meetup, I met Jameson, I met Cody Orgel, I met Thrifty Treasures, Bonafide Hustler, Rake and Profit. So many other people I didn't even know made content I met. And it was just a really fun experience. And it is something that I look forward to doing much more in the future, even after everything that's going on right now comes to a manageable level. I will go ahead, uh, before I conclude this video, put some pictures up of some of the people that I have met over the last few years. But before I do, again, I want to thank you all for following me on my journey to reselling and seeing what the future holds for me. So again, thank you all so much for supporting me, what I'm doing, watching my videos, commenting, and just being very supportive of 
me doing what I do because outside of this, because I have another job, I'm pretty much the ordinary person. This is not something that I do to like get the whole world to notice me. Like not to make this rambly, but I am I'm extroverted. Let me let me say this, but my social skills are kind of like a light switch. Like, you know, with my retail job, I can bring out my extrovertedness. Like talking to people is not a big issue. And meeting new people outside of my job is not difficult for me because of my personality, but I can switch the introvert on too. Like if I just don't want to deal with people and I want to be at home and I just want to not have to interact with anybody, I will turn that switch on. Like it's just easy for me to transition from one to the other. So in a way, I guess you could call me an introverted extrovert or an extroverted introvert, whichever one you prefer. So again, thank you all so much for watching my content, and let me go ahead and show you a couple of those pictures before we conclude.